It has been a while since the last book video came out, so I thought I would do this and talk about the books I've been reading. As you can see, I've been reading a fair bit over the past couple of months. For those of you who are new, by the way, to this kind of series of book stuff on this channel, um, this is where I talk about what I've been reading, uh, normally over the past couple of months, to be fair. Hasn't been that regular. I review the books that I've been reading, talk about what I liked, what I didn't like, and then give a recommendation or a lack of recommendation. For those of you new to the channel, hi, my name's Simon. Um, I just finished a PhD in atmospheric physics and I am now a full-time science communicator. I, along with those geeky things, happen to like books. Surprise, surprise. And the first book I wanna talk about is Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. So Chris Voss was a negotiator in the FBI. He was the person who'd be on the phone to the kidnappers, the terrorists, the whatever, the bank robbers, um, and would be the person talking them down, negotiating with them, and basically wrote a book collecting the, I think there's 10 lessons in here, it might be eight or something like that. 10, I was right, that he found most useful. And it is a very easy to read book, actually. Um, a lot of these, what I think of as like self-help books, this isn't a self-help book, um, but they can be like fluff. It's like, just get to the point already. Um, this wasn't like that. It's actually relatively slim, um, but it contains genuinely very useful information. Um, my PhD vibe is coming up and I'm gonna be rereading this uh, to pick up on, well, refresh a few tips um, on how to deal, even though that's, it's kind of an negotiation, I suppose, in the vibe I'm defending my research, um, but I have to convince somebody that I am, you know, worth giving a PhD to. And there are some very, very useful things in this. For example, the process of saying no and building to the point where you say yes, and also convincing somebody on the other side of the table to um, agree to, to something, not immediately, but by building to that point, making it more likely that they are actually going to see through the plans that you have mutually made. Like genuinely, very, very useful things. So I definitely recommend this to anyone who is interested in basically getting more out of interpersonal kind of negotiations. And that doesn't have to be a formal negotiation. It could be an interview or it could be, um, you know, like basically haggling. Like there's a, there's a story about somebody bringing the price of a car down in this. I think it's actually Boss himself. They're useful life lessons to learn. Um, I honestly would recommend this to pretty much anybody. Although I will say the thing that made me shy away from giving it like a complete five-star glowing review was that there isn't, it's not exactly life-changing. Like, the, the book is what it is. Useful lessons, but kind of nothing more than that. And I like the fact that it's sort of unassuming in that sense. Like, it doesn't have pretensions that it's somehow this is, you know, this book is going to change your life. It doesn't try and do that. But at the same time, I felt like there was a kind of spark missing from it. So, very, very good, but not fantastic. This stands in contrast to the next book, The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. So I bought this book uh, in Bristol Airport when I was gonna be going on a quick holiday, like a couple of days away to Croatia. And so I devoured this book over the course of like four days or something like that. Um, and it completely drew me in. Uh, it completely sucked me into the world and uh, really shook me up, actually. I realized that a lot of the books that I talk about here and also on my Goodreads, which I'll link down there, which has like full reviews of everything I'm talking about. I realized that a lot of the stuff I talk about is nonfiction because I don't know, maybe it's just the way I am. But um, this was a conscious effort to read more fiction. And I picked it up basically because it won the Pulitzer Prize and Barack Obama said it was terrific. And would you know what? He was right. Because not only is this a fantastic story, um, it's a story about basically two runaway slaves um, from a plantation in the South of America during, well, the pre-Civil War era. It also taught me an awful lot about, I don't wanna say subtleties, but sort of certainly here in the UK, lesser known aspects of slavery, like the things that they did, not gonna spoil anything, but the things they did in North Carolina, I think it was, to do with the hospitals. And also what you could think of as like the resistance to slavery, the um, titular Underground Railroad, which for those of you who don't know, and I didn't know this, was the um, series of people um, across America who would try and convey escaped slaves to the North and to safety. Uh, whereas if they stayed in the South, they could be hunted down. And one of the uh, antagonists in the book is effectively a bounty hunter for slaves. He would capture slaves, bring them back to their old masters. And in fact, scattered throughout the book, there are adverts that were placed, here's one, um, real adverts which were placed uh, to uh, basically advertise saying, look, I've lost this slave, uh, the, a girl of this age, the, these distinguishing things. And then people would read those adverts and go and catch these people and bring them back like they were property. Well, because I suppose to the people, 
The slave owners, that's what they were. So for the story, for the uh, mixing of fiction and history uh, and the things that I learned from it, uh, that alone, uh, highly, highly recommended. I mean, I gave this book five stars on Goodreads. I thought it was fantastic. But more than that, it also made me realize that um, pretty much everything else I've read in my life has been by uh, a white guy. Uh, and it's normally a guy. Yes, I have read some, some books by women, but it is almost comic how narrow my reading has been. So this has really spurred me to seek out um, other books written by authors of colour uh, and, you know, voices that I <laughs> that are very dissimilar to my everyday existence. So I have, on my Goodreads, actually, I've put in a whole bunch of books which are going to try and fulfil that. So I'm very keen to read more like this. So it's a very good book and it's kind of transformative. So very solid recommendation. Next, another fantastic book, Isaac Newton by James Gleick. This was an impulse buy. Um, I have, as you'll see at the end of this video, so many books that I need to read, but when I saw this in, um, what's the Cambridge version of Blackwell's? Heifers in Cambridge. Uh, I had to buy it. I bought like three books. I, my, my girlfriend left me alone and unattended for like five minutes and I came back and I bought like three or four books. Um, but I had to get this. I just had to because I have yet to read a, a good sort of authoritative biography of Isaac Newton. I read a few things as a kid, so I, I know a fair bit about his life. Um, but I did still learn things from this. What I will definitely say is that this is a fantastically researched and fantastically written biography. It's actually quite small for um, a man of Newton's stature who was so unbelievably influential. And, you know, I'm saying that as a physicist, um, uh, that uh, he had influence on other areas like the Royal Mint and how currency is used in the UK. Um, it's less than 200 pages. Um, and it actually, it, it's one of these books where each sentence has been very, very carefully worded um, to get the maximum meaning out of the sentence. And I, I definitely need to read more Glyke because this, yeah, this is like my paradigm now for how well you can write the prose in a biography. So as you might expect for a biography, uh, it starts at his childhood and it works forwards. It doesn't tend to jump around much. And I will say that from a scientific perspective, it mostly talks about his theory of gravity, which is phenomenal and uh, his print, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce it, Principia or Principia? The big old book that he wrote about physics. It focuses on those um, and so his laws of motion as well. But it doesn't provide a huge amount of detail apart from in gravity, which I, I, you know, I, I just finished a PhD in atmospheric physics. I might be alone and wanting a little bit more scientific detail. But um, yeah, I, I could have done with a little bit more detail on that stuff. Of course, I don't need to tell you that Newton was a genius and a brilliant physicist. Um, you know, it be probably the greatest physicist of all time. And the book does get that across. One of the uh, chapters is literally called, Is He Like Other Men? Um, <laughs> the answer to which is basically no. But the interesting thing that it gets across is that he was fun also a fundamentally strange, quite bitter, cold, cruel man. And the other thing is he is very petulant, uh, which I didn't no, actually, before I read this, um, that basically when things didn't go his way, he was like, ah, I'm just going to cut the rest of the world out. I'm not going to write to anybody. I'm not going to reply to anyone. I'm just going to shut myself away in Cambridge. And credit to the book and credit to Glyke, as I've said, for, for writing it so well, because it's an engaging read. Um, it's it, it's quite heavy material, really, you know, like the development of the first field theory and the foundations of modern physics and, you know, overthrowing uh, the way in which the we thought about the universe before. This really does cement him as being so significant. The thing I will say against this book is that it suffers suffers from a lack of overall arc, like an overall... I, I, it's a biography, it's not fiction, I know, but it suffers from a lack of overall story, and I think it uh, compares poorly with The Strangest Man, which is about Paul Dirac, another amazing physicist by um, Graham Farmello, um, which has inherently, because of who Dirac was, it has much more of an arc to it, and I highly recommend that if you haven't read that. Um, that's the best biography I've ever read. Um, and this suffered from that. Possibly I'm just spoiled because that is such a fantastic book, but this could have done with um, more of a, yeah, more of an overall structure to it. But still, again, another recommendation. Then penultimately, I'm going to talk very quickly about two very geeky books. So these are Flight of the Einstein by James Swallow and Fulgrim by Graham McNeil. Uh, I'm a massive fan of Warhammer 40,000 and I have read countless Warhammer 40k books. Um, these are in the Horus Heresy series, which is an ongoing series of like 40 books now or something crazy. These are towards the start. I'm making my way through them after a long hiatus. Um, 
and I will briefly review these as they are fun if you know the law, but they are also interesting to read um, as somebody who is interested in writing and interesting in reviewing books because they're not well written. In fact, they're supremely overwritten. I enjoyed them, but I wouldn't recommend them to anyone who's like, uh, who's not a diehard 40k fan. And then finally, we come to the most talked about book in this video, which is Turtles All the Way Down by John Green. Now, I actually don't have a copy with me because I lent it to my girlfriend. Uh, because I basically pressed it on her and I was like, you need to read this. Which, funnily enough, was what I said to a lot of people about The Fault in Our Stars, Green's previous book. But my short review of Turtles, as I'm going to refer to it, because it's quite a wordy title, is that it's fantastic. I think it's an important book. The comparison I make on my Goodreads review of it is um, comparing it to The Fort in Our Stars, which obviously went on to huge commercial success. You know, it was a worldwide bestseller. It was turned into a film. Um, you know, it, it was this huge phenomenon. Um, I am going to guess that this book will not cause such a phenomenon, but I think it is much more mature and I think it is a better book. Um, Tiffios, The Fault in Our Stars, dealt with um, teenagers with cancer, falling in love, going to Amsterdam, it was like a fairy tale story. And in that sense, um, comparing it to Turtles, to me, is like comparing Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen with Persuasion, also by Austen. Um, one is very, very famous, and it's kind of schmaltzy and fairy tale, which is definitely what um, Tiffios was like. And Persuasion is much more realistic. It was written later in her career and she had a much more moderate, realistic view about romance, I guess. And that is my impression of Turtles. It is written by an author who is a bit older, who is more mature in their craft and is more confident in what they are saying. And much as I wish that the book is going to go on and be just as successful, I can't help but feel like it, it won't because maybe people aren't ready for that realism. Um, especially being marketed as a young adult novel. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, I know this is a generalization, but I feel like uh, young adults don't necessarily want something that is realistic or bleak. Um, they want something perhaps that's a bit more idealistic. But coming in as an adult reader, um, I, I enjoyed it more. And I was hit quite hard emotionally by, by bits of the book. Like The Fault in Our Stars, it deals with a very sick... A uh, young woman who is the protagonist and her close friends and her romantic life. I'm not going to say anything more spoilery than that. So you could argue that there are parallels between the two books. And when I started reading it, I got into the story and I thought, oh, here we go. It's exactly like all of his other books. You know, it's like Tiffio's. There's the, the young, um, overly intellectual girl who's uh, going to be falling in love. Or it's going to be uh, like his previous novels where there's this idealized person and they're going to fall for them. Um, but he presumably completely consciously flips that on its head and uh, instead takes that framework in a completely different direction and kind of says, well, you know what? Forget about that mystery adventure story. Like, let's actually delve into these characters and let's let's talk about what is wrong here. Because while cancer was the sickness of the Fortnite stars, anxiety, and I suppose you could say more broadly mental health, is the sickness in Turtles All the Way Down. As somebody who has suffered from mental health problems in the past, um, I won't, again, I won't give any spoilers to this, but as the book kind of swept towards the um, climax of the story, it the things get bad, basically. Um, and I thought, oh, wow, okay, perhaps you could have gone a little bit further then. Um, it's great that the, the ideas are on the stage and being seen and talked about, but okay, I feel like it's been shoved under the rug. Not at all, because at the very end, in the very last chapter, it's uh, it's almost like the book takes on a completely new life and like it's speaking directly to you. It doesn't, but it's as if it, he is speaking directly to you about these issues and um, a, a maps out a future. I won't say, yeah, I can't, I can't say anything more than that. Maps out a future which, I don't know, just suddenly speak, spoke to me, certainly, on a very, very, very deep level. And I don't know if that's because I'm, I've had experiences with mental health in the past or because I'm human. Um, but it was profoundly affecting the end. And I, I put it down. I remember reading it in bed, finished it. And I just sat there thinking about it for a long, long time. And um, just thinking to myself after a while, yeah, this, this feels like an important book. I know that his other books are taught on, in some schools, and well, they're banned in some other schools, but 
I really hope that this gets widely read by young people because it's an important discussion about mental health. If I were to offer any criticism, I would say that it shares previous faults uh, with his with his other books in that his protagonists are um, young people, you know, they're, they're teenagers in school and they have incredibly intellectual thoughts and conversations and you, <laughs> in reading it, I can basically hear John Green's voice. I can, I can from his YouTube uh, work, I can hear the fact that these are his thoughts and I, you just can't help but think this is not how, this is not spoken with the eloquence of a 16 year old or a 15 year old this is spoken with the eloquence of a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old who has thought about these issues for a long time. John Green's teenagers are always very, very smart and intellectual. And I think a lot of people's problems with it is that they are too smart and too eloquent and uh, not really representative of teenagers. Um, perhaps teenagers think they are that smart, but I don't think in reality any, any teenager I've met has been quite as uh, bright as any of the people in John Green's books. So that is that I think you could say is a criticism. You could also argue that the lack of kind of like adventure frame that you're hanging it on is a criticism, but I didn't mind those. I thought it was a wonderful book. Definitely recommend it. So this video has already gone on for way too long. So I'm just going to quickly round off with what I'm currently reading, uh, which is Memes in Digital Culture by Limor Schiffman, which is a quite hardcore theoretical discussion of memes in society and um, not just comparing them to sort of Dawkins' idea of memes, but actually, you know, really kind of quite in detail sociological stuff. And The Prince by Machiavelli, um, a book that I've been meaning to read for a very long time because I know it's all about basically sort of how to gain power and hold on to it. And I feel like that's something I know little about and it might be useful maybe to learn about. Um, so far, it's I'm about halfway through. It's quite dense. Um, and I've definitely, there's definitely a few quotations that seared into my mind and I was like, oh, that's good. But um, I haven't become a prince yet. So I don't know. Mixed review. And then following up from The Prince, I actually have a whole bunch of these. Penguin did a, uh, a cool uh, series of big thoughts, you know, in like, I guess you could call them pamphlets. Um, so like Common Sense by Thomas Paine. So I'm gonna make my way through these one by one. Um, I haven't actually started the Nietzsche, Why I Am So Wise. Uh, don't like Nietzsche, I, um, I don't think. And then between those, I'm also gonna be reading Artemis by uh, Andy Weir, who I met. In fact, this copy was signed for me a couple of days ago, Andy. Really nice guy. So that's gonna be like my pulpy filler between the two because I love The Martian and based on the talk he gave uh, when I got assigned, um, this is gonna be, this is gonna be fun. And then finally, I have a whole bunch of other books that I still need to read, which I've been saying I'm gonna read for quite some time, like A History of the World and 12 Maps, 15 Million Degrees, The Water Book. I think two new ones, which I haven't mentioned, are Flatland, my very, very battered copy of Flatland, uh, an adventure, is, uh, sorry, a romance of many dimensions, and Eureka, which is about the birth of modern science and um, how the Greeks basically kind of laid the foundations for what we think of as science nowadays. This was a Christmas present from my girlfriend's family. So I'm, this is this is going to be um, actually reading through it. It looks, it looks like a quick read, but very interesting. Like I mentioned earlier, if you want any more detail on my reviews of these books or what else I've got on my shelf to read, um, there's a link to my Goodreads down there in the description. And also in the description are Amazon links to the books that I've been talking about in this video. I would suggest that you try and support your local bookshops where possible because I love a good bookshop, but I realise that's not possible for everyone. So uh, yeah, if you want to get one of those books on Amazon, link's down there. Thank you for watching this video. I realise it's been quite a long one, but um, if you have any thoughts on the books that I've been talking about in this video, please do leave them in the comments below. In particular, um, if you have any thoughts about uh, Turtles All The Way Down, I'd be interested to hear them because uh, based on Goodreads, opinions seem to be somewhat split. And then if you have any further recommendations, not that I don't have a whole pile of books at my feet already. If you have any recommendations for me, then please do put those in the comments as well. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it, and if you're not already, please subscribe to the channel for more book videos in the future. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.